Let's to uh, 1 John chapter 2, and uh, we're going to be starting chapter 2, and we started 1 John uh, about three weeks ago, and I've been working through that and uh, gleaning from that, and just want to remind you, kind of big picture, some of the things that John, the writer, was seeking to address in uh, that book, that letter to those uh, he was writing to. I remember during that time, this really philosophy, this worldview of Gnosticism was really present. And so a lot of what John writes about in 1 John has to do with addressing that worldview. And that worldview, we could kind of sum it up really in a simplified form that really it separated out things that were spiritual and things that were physical. And the spiritual was elevated and was uh, communicated as being more important and uh, more worthy. And so just realizing if Jesus came in the flesh, if he was actually a man, they viewed that that was less. That was something that Jesus lowered himself. He couldn't actually be God. If spiritual things are good, physical things are bad, and Jesus came in the flesh, he couldn't be good. He couldn't be equal with God. He was lesser. And so Gnosticism was really a, a pretty dangerous worldview and perspective, and it separated out these two aspects of life. And we realize that in some respects, we do this today. We separate out and we say certain aspects of our life are spiritual, certain aspects are physical, certain parts of our life are good, certain parts are not so good, and we we segment out, we compartmentalize our life. And we think about how risky that is that we spiritualize certain parts, we make certain parts of our life sacred, certain parts are just secular, they're just me, it's just what I do on a daily basis, and then I serve Jesus over here. And that totally nullifies the fact that Christ is supposed to be all of us. He's supposed to reign in our life. He's supposed to have complete control and authority, not just in some areas, but in all areas. And so John, again, really writes to address that. We're going to look at the first three verses of chapter 2, really with this main idea that what we do, both physically and spiritually, matters. What we do, how we live, matters and is important. Our motivation, what we're going to talk about, comes from what Christ has done for us. But the impact, the result of what Christ has done should be that we obey him, we follow him, we live for him, and it matters what we do here. So, Pastor, share that with us. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Marcus. So as we look at chapter 2, we realize that when John wrote this, he didn't write in chapters and verses. He just wrote a letter. And we need to kind of back up and understand what he, what we just saw in this letter Remember that John said, God is light, and in him there is no darkness. And that kind of creates a dilemma for us. If God is pure and holy and righteous, and there's no shadow, there's no hint of evil with him, he's not a balance of good or bad, that he is holy, then at the same moment we realize we are not. And it creates that dilemma to say, how do we, as beings who are, are corrupt, who are dealing with sin, how do we relate to a holy God? And, and the last part of what we call chapter 1 John kind of lines out that it's not just in what you claim. You can claim that you have no sin, but you're deceiving yourself. You can claim that there's no problem with sin, or you've got it all handled, or that God is okay with you, and and you're making God a liar when you do that. But as we look at this new portion, what we now call chapter 2, we realize that John is laying out for us that there is a way to deal with sin. There is a way, and God has provided that way to deal with sin, and what we do matters. So 1 John, we're looking at chapter 2, just those first three verses. It reads this way in the New American Standard. He says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is also the propitiation for our sin. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. There's just, there's... Oh, so much in this, these few verses, these few lines. I want to just grab a hold of five phrases in these verses, just kind of to grab a hold of some of the meat in this passage and to look at that and to understand what John is declaring for us. And and we start with this phrase, my little children. My little children. You know, as John writes these words, he really is expressing the heart of God. 
these words express that they mirror the heart of God. They echo the heart of God as God would address us as his little children. And, you know, as he does this, he begins to set the tone now for all of the instruction that follows. He's going to be pretty blunt in some of those instructions about sin and what we're doing and what we say we do, but what we do in reality. And he's going to address it very specifically and in some cases bluntly. But he's doing that from a different foundation. He's setting this tone of love. My little children, he says. You know, and even in that sense, he's not, he's not changing his tone. I kind of thought that as I looked at this and puzzled over it the last few weeks. You know, is John kind of backing up here and now taking a new tack? He starts the letter with some pretty direct statements. We, we saw these last week. Say, he says, if, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. A little further down, if we say we have not sin, we're calling God a liar. And, and now he's coming to a new phrase. And it's, I don't think this is a case where John is backing up and saying, no, we kind of got off to a wrong start here. My little children. Let, let, let's start over again. Let me call you my little children. I, I say that because I wonder why he didn't just start his letter with that. My little children, here's what I need you to know. It's not so much that he is, that he's changing his direction. It's not, he's not changing his tone. But really what he is doing at this point is he's demonstrating the desire of a loving Heavenly Father. That really is. This is, this is the basis, this is the foundation, this is the tone for all of that instruction that follows. This is the desire of our Heavenly Father who loves us. These aren't the demands of a harsh taskmaster. These aren't the demands of a God who, who would keep us under his thumb, who would keep us from having any fun. A God who is, who is a harsh master. These are the instructions of a loving Heavenly Father. We need to hear them that way. So, and, and all of Scripture really is, has that tone. So when we read in Scripture, thou shalt not, or in the positive, thou shalt, this is not a harsh God demanding of us. This is a loving Father desiring for us. This is what our Heavenly Father desires for us. So what does he desire for us? Well, that next phrase that we see there. That you may not sin. I'm writing these things, he says, that you may not sin. Now, again, the, these are the words. This, this is a tender concern. I'm writing these things that you may not sin. His concern for us is to walk in holiness, to walk in righteousness. This could have been written a lot differently. Think about if this were instructions, if these were demands and commands from, from a harsh deity it could sound a lot different, and it would read a lot different. It could, it could read this way, that, that I'm writing to you to warn you, you better shape up or else. I am writing to you to let you know that you better toe the line. But that's not the tone that he sets. He says, I'm writing to you that you may not sin, because there's something much better for you than that. Now, make no mistake. God is serious about sin. God is absolutely serious about sin. God doesn't change his mind about sin. Through the Old Testament and the New Testament, what, what Scripture declares that he delights in and what Scripture declares that he detests, he hasn't changed in that. Because God doesn't change. The, the Bible word that we use, the theological word, he is immutable. I mean, he doesn't change. He doesn't morph. He doesn't grow. He doesn't, in that sense, mature because he is, he is perfect. He doesn't change. So he doesn't change his mind about sin. His, his attitude towards sin isn't affected by popular opinion. It's not affected by what culture allows and what culture accepts. God's attitude towards sin remains the same, and he is serious about sin. He doesn't change his mind. And and as God is serious about sin, we realize, and it is unfolded for us in Scripture, that he will deal with sin. And when God deals with sin, he will deal with it severely. It's not something that he would take lightly. 
Not something that he would dismiss and not something that he would excuse and not something that he winks at. Sometimes, I wonder even in the church if we develop that attitude that we know what we're doing isn't pleasing to God, but somehow we think that God is just going to kind of wink at it and say, oh, you rascals, you. God doesn't change his mind. And when he deals with sin, he's going to deal with it pretty severely. When we think about that, we think and we, we understand again, we come back to that, that truth that what we do matters. It matters to God. It matters in the world. It matters in, in enjoying all that God has for us. And God's heart and his desire for us is that we would enjoy all of that. That we would enjoy fellowship with him. That we would enjoy the blessing that we were created to enjoy but we can't do that if we continue to live in a way that is contrary to his heart. What we do matters. And this is the instruction from a loving Heavenly Father who would simply say, little children, listen. I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. I don't want you to go in that direction. Don't go in that direction. Because what you do really does matter. Cannot. We cannot be casual about sin. And everything in our culture would, would point us there. But we cannot be casual. We cannot be careless. We cannot be lazy about sin. We can't develop that attitude. What we do really does matter. God has provided a way to deal with sin. And that's John's point here. We've got two great descriptions for right here in these verses. John says, I'm writing these things that you may not sin. What you do really matters. Don't don't be casual. Don't be careless about sin. But if you do sin, this is what God has done for us. This is the provision for us. And, And our provision and our dealing with sin isn't in simply what we claim and trying to convince ourselves and trying to lie to ourselves and trying to convince God. Here's how we deal with sin. This is how God deals with sin. This next line, What a great picture. Little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an advocate with the Father. Now, what does that mean? This word advocate, this is a great word picture. We see it throughout uh, the Gospels in the New Testament, especially John. John is one who really kind of hits on this idea and kind of brings this idea to us. An advocate... Uh, Just think of it this way. It's somebody who is at our side and on our side. Great description, isn't it? Somebody who is at our side, somebody who is present with us, somebody who won't abandon us, and somebody who is on our side. We have that advocate with the Father. Now, as we think about that, I want to make sure that we don't go in a wrong direction because there is out there, hopefully none of us here would, would entertain these ideas, but there is out there this idea that God is a harsh taskmaster. He is a harsh deity, and Jesus is the one who kind of moderates that. That we have harsh God and loving Jesus. And, and Jesus is the one who would insist on mercy and plead for mercy and grace, while God would have the heart to, to destroy and bring judgment. This is not a case of, well, we say it this way, good deity, bad deity, good cop, bad cop. This is not a case where Jesus, our advocate, is the one who moderates the harshness and and the wrath of God. That's the wrong picture. It, 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 It really doesn't fit here. Keep this in mind. The advocate is the one who is at our side and on our side, and the advocate is the one who answers the charges against us. Now, just put that on the back burner for a minute. He answers the charges that are against us. This word advocate, I mentioned before, John kind of picks up in this word. We see it in the Gospel of John three or four times. But in the Gospel of John, he uses a different word. Remember about John chapter 14, as Jesus is preparing to, uh, to leave them? He's pointing to the cross, he's anticipating the cross, he's going away. But he makes this promise, he says, I will ask my Father and he will send you another, what is it? Comforter or helper. The word that John uses here is parakletus. Paraclete. One who is called alongside. 
And so when he uses that in the gospel, he uses that term, I will send you another helper, another comforter. And that word another, by the way, means of the same kind. I'm going to bring you a comforter of the same kind. I'm going to bring you a helper of the same kind who will be at your side. He will be on your side. But in those cases... In the Gospel of John, that word is translated a comforter or a helper. Depends on which translation you use. So the question is, well, why don't we read that here? Why don't they use the same word in this case? Why don't we read it in in his letter? He says, if anyone sins, we have a helper with the Father. Or we have a comforter with the Father. Why the word advocate? And by the way, I think the word advocate is the best word to use in this case. The reason is... In Greek, in non-biblical Greek, examples of Greek writing from this time, this word, parakletus, was often used to describe a defense counsel. Somebody who would stand with you at a court of law and who would speak on your behalf or who would testify for you, who would answer the charges against you. Isn't that a great picture of what we have in heaven? We have somebody who is at our side and on our side who answers the charges against us. But be careful here. This defense counsel answering the charges. We have to have the whole and complete picture because who is bringing the charges? Who is Jesus answering at this point? Who is he countering? It's not God. It's not our Heavenly Father, but it's our enemy, Satan. You know, there's another passage of Scripture that just kind of ties into this, and it makes sense. Just jot in your notes this reference. Revelation, chapter 12, verse 10. Revelation, chapter 12, we're we're kind of getting now, we're jumping in the middle of this great scene in heaven, but it's kind of telling us the end of the story. Revelation chapter 12, listen to what this says. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before God day and night. Who's the accuser? Satan. It's our enemy who accuses us day and night before the Father. And it's our defense counselor, it's our advocate, it's our helper who stands at our side and on our side who answers every one of those charges. And I just, my imagination runs with that. My imagination is that continually the enemy says, look, see it again. Another sin, another rebellion against you. He knew better than that. That was a blatant violation of your standard, God. That was, a, that was a purposeful choice to rebel against you. By all rights, that person ought to be condemned. They ought to, they, uh, you know, that's, that's mine. That's now my territory, the enemy says. Accusing us every time. And I just imagine the answer to that. Because it's our advocate who answers the charge against that. And the answer is, you know what? You're absolutely right. It was a violation. And God's holy standard says that that deserves death. But it's already been paid. It's been paid. And that's the continual answer to every one of those charges. But it's been paid. It's been paid. There was a death. There was a death. And that death, of course, was his death on our behalf. This is Jesus Christ, the righteous, John says. It's interesting. Just kind of puzzle on that. Why does he... he, specifically give that title, Jesus Christ the Righteous. Very simply, we would look at this and say, who else is qualified? Who else is qualified to stand before the throne of God and plead for us? And to be on our side and to answer the charges. This is the one, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, this is the one who knew no sin, who became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So maybe part of that answer is, yeah, but he's clothed with righteousness. I know what the act was. I know what the rebellion was. It was been paid for in full. I carried it to the cross. I paid it in full. And now look, I've left him with my righteousness. It's Jesus, the righteous, who is our advocate. And not only is he our advocate, and, not, and, and this is why he is qualified to be our advocate, he's also the propitiation for our sin. My favorite word. 
my favorite word. Just one, because it's fun to say, but two, because of what it means. The propitiation of our sin. Look again how, how John says this. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sin. And not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. So this word propitiation, basically, it means, it can mean two things. It can mean to appease or to satisfy. To satisfy or to appease. And, and by the way, this is where that, that phrase at the beginning of the chapter, the beginning of the verse, this is how it sets the tone, my little children. There's a tenderness here. There's a tender concern here. And so in that sense, when we're, we're picking up on this theme of tenderness and concern, appease just doesn't really seem to fit. We're not, we're not here to appease a harsh God. As in paying a tribute to a God so that we can maybe get favor from him or we can stay on his good side. You know, the, the religion of man would have that idea that somehow we have to appease God, we have to bring an offering to God so we can somehow stay on his good side. Well, that's kind of what I think of when I hear the word appease. So I, I don't think that's the best fitting word. But the other part of that, to satisfy that in Jesus, God is satisfied. What does that mean? Well, that, here's the wonderful truth of that. That the holiness and the righteousness of God is satisfied. The holiness and the righteousness of God demands that sin be dealt with, and it be dealt with completely and severely. The holiness and, and righteousness of God says this is the standard, and nothing short of that will do. And any rebellion against that is deserving of as Roman says, a penalty of death. It's deserving of separation from God for all eternity. That's what sin and rebellion require. And yet, that was satisfied in Jesus. Look at the other side of that. God is a God of love and mercy. And his love wouldn't be denied. And so in Christ, we have both of these things completely true and completely satisfied. In Jesus and his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, we have, we have the righteousness of God satisfied without compromising his love. But we also have his love satisfied without compromising his righteousness. And so in Jesus, God is satisfied. But I want to look at that word and look at maybe in a little different nuance. That God is satisfied. We put those two things together. He is the propitiation. He's the one who satisfies God. But he's also our advocate, the one who answers the charges against us. And I want to make sure that we understand this correctly. Our advocate did, hear it correctly, our advocate did not argue for mercy. Hear that? Our advocate didn't argue for mercy in, in this sense or, or argue for leniency. Maybe that is even the better word. He didn't argue for leniency. He didn't say, God, you know, could you just back it off a little bit and, 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 and to bring judgment, but not complete judgment. Bring enough judgment so you're satisfied, but don't, don't destroy them completely. That, that our advocate didn't argue for leniency. Turn that around. And we understand the wonderful truth of our advocate and our propitiation. That we experience the mercy of God because God didn't hold anything back. In Christ, God didn't hold anything back. The complete wrath of God, his complete holy righteous demands were de demonstrated and played out at the cross. He didn't hold anything back. So when we think of our advocate saying... God, could you take it easy on him? Maybe it was just the opposite. Our advocate says, God, pour out your wrath and do it completely so that your righteous demands would be met and your righteous demands would be satisfied. And do that, Father, in such a way that your love is also satisfied that you could redeem them because God is about redemption. God didn't hold back. And by the way, just another reason why we cannot have a casual attitude towards sin. 
those who have experienced the mercy of God because his full wrath has been poured out at the cross, once you grab a hold of that, once you understand what that took, once you understand what it means that he is the propitiation of our sin, how could we have, how could we have a casual attitude, a lazy, careless attitude about sin? What we do matters. We have to have that attitude. Because we've experienced the mercy of God. Because the full wrath was played out. We can't have a casual attitude. One more phrase here that we would look at. This is interesting. Not just for us, John says. He himself is the propitiation for our sin, and not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. For the whole world. Now, again, be careful with this. There, this is not universalism. There is a religious philosophy that teaches that eventually everybody is saved because ultimately God is too good to really ever condemn anybody. Therefore, we're all good. Universalism. Everybody's saved. And they would point to verses like this to say, he died for the sin of the whole world. He's the propitiation of the whole world. Therefore, doesn't matter. You're all covered. For God so loved the world, you're all covered. It's not what this is. Not, that's not a good understanding. By the way, we always understand Scripture with Scripture. So where, you know, we might, we might say, kind of points there, we look at the whole of Scripture and say, what, is, what does all of Scripture tell us? All of Scripture tells us that, um, that God's heart is to redeem. A couple of really important things in this phrase for the whole world, a couple of things that it points out is, one is that just the sufficiency, but also the exclusivity of, of his sacrifice. That when Jesus went to the cross and bore our sin, that was sufficient payment for the world, for all who would grab a hold of that, to all who would come, to all that would just in, in faith and in desperation cry out and say, God, let that death count for me. For all who would do that. Sadly, we know not all will do that. It was sufficient for the whole world, but not everybody will grab a hold of that. Not everybody will, will grab that by faith and believe that by faith. So the sad truth is not everybody will be saved. God loved the world. And his propitiation, his, that, that, that debt was satisfied if only we would grab it by faith. It was sufficient. It's also exclusive. When we think about that other side, that there is no other way. There's no other way. There's no other name given under heaven by which you must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. It's exclusive. That was it. It was for the whole world. Not a regional plan of salvation. Not a cultural plan of salvation. This was for the whole world. This is God's plan to redeem the world. This and this alone. We've said this a couple times now. What do we see in this phrase? Not just our sin, he's a propitiation, not just for us, but that of the whole world. This is God's heart. God's heart is to redeem. It's to redeem. That's his first heart. That's why he would dress us this way, my little children. Oh, this is what I want you to grab a hold of. This is where I want you to live. This is what I want you to understand, that there's this problem with sin. But little children, understand this, that you have somebody who is on your side. And not only is he on your side, but he is the one who has satisfied that debt. His heart is to redeem us. You know, Peter says it this way, talking about the promises of God, talking about the, the promise of wrath and judgment. And some wondered, well, if there really is a God who is a God of wrath, why haven't we seen it yet? Because certainly this world deserves wrath and God hasn't poured it out, so probably he's not going to. The answer to that is God is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. But he's waiting. Because God's heart is this. He's not willing that any should perish, but all would come to a knowledge of repentance. God is withholding that in his mercy, in his grace, so that more and more would come to that knowledge of salvation. His heart is to redeem, and yet, sadly, not everybody will be redeemed. Some will reject that. Some will be so casual about sin and so careless about sin that they think that they are okay with God, and they'll miss it. Which is another reason, again, why we can't be casual about sin. What we do matters. 
matters in our life to enjoy all that God has for us, and it matters in the lives of the people around us. Because we want them to see God. We want them to see Christ in us. We want them to understand that, that there is a problem with sin and there's a consequence of sin and the consequences are multiple, but the ultimate consequence is separation from God and death and condemnation. We want them to see in us that there's a different way, that there is joy and there is gladness in Christ when we grab a hold of that. And if we are casual about sin, how will they see that? What we do matters. And really that's part of John's theme. But it's all based upon not what we are able to accomplish. It's not on, on how we're able to act. It's all based on what has been done for us. So we keep coming back to that. Who is Christ? What has he done? Who is Christ? What has he done? What does it mean for us? And so here's the big idea. Here's the thought that I want you to take away today. We have a settled condition in heaven. We have an advocate who is on our side. An advocate who has been the one who satisfies the righteous demands of God. We have an advocate in heaven. And our position, our condition in heaven is saddled, settled. So our, con, our settled condition in heaven should settle our practice on earth. Because of who you are in Christ should make a difference in how you live. Don't turn it around. You don't live to gain a position in heaven. But your position in heaven should determine how you live. Your settled condition in heaven should settle your practice on earth. Amen? That's what the world needs. The world needs to see that and hear it. There is joy and peace. There is love. There is healing. There is hope in Jesus. And that's what the world is so hungry for right now. Our privilege is to live that. Amen? Father, we thank you for that privilege. We would pray that from this place we would go out and live that, that we, we would be purposeful in how we live, not because we're trying to appease you, but because you've already been satisfied in Christ. We've tasted that. We've tasted your mercy. We know your love and your grace. And so, Father, we would pray that you would have us live in a way that reflects that. Father, for those who don't know, we would pray that there would be a nagging of their hearts and their spirit until they would come to that place of yielding to you and crying out in desperation, God, let Jesus' death count for me. For those around us who need to hear that, we would pray for boldness to speak that truth and to live that truth and to demonstrate your heart of compassion to them. We thank you, Father, for that privilege. In Jesus' name, amen.